So yeah, the format of the session will be a 45 minute um, presentation by four ex fellow students, followed by some questions and hopefully an open discussion about some of the issues and ideas explored through the project, particularly in relation to the natural environment and architectural education. So please do um, put any questions or comments you may have in the chat box. So the presentation is made up of five sections. I will give an overview and introduction to the project and um, sort of uh, the, the work in Diploma Unit 7. Josh will then talk about uh, the design development of the project. Holly will talk about the build itself and Lawrence will then uh, talk about uh, the project in relation to materials, elements and also completion. So it is, it's worth uh, reiterating that the project was designed, developed and built by a group of 14 students of Unit 7 at London Metropolitan University as part of our Part 2 education in 2018 and 19. The unit was led by David Grandorge and Paloma Gormley of Practice Architecture. Um, the project builds on previous built work by the unit and emerged in the context of Practice Architecture's research into natural materials and low carbon construction techniques. Unit 7 has long been interested in materials and construction and often explores and tests precedents and proposals through large physical models at 1 to 20 or 1 to 10. And here you can see this is a 1 to 1 facade prototype built by the unit in 2006 um, at the old campus in Holloway Road. In, 2000, in 2008, the unit built and designed Finn Forest Pavilion, which was exhibited at EcoBuild. And um, sort of arising out of a concern about material resources and the life cycle of buildings, the unit ensured that the um, pavilion found a new home at, um, on the Hatsfin estate. And in 2018, this building um, was actually repurposed uh, to form office spaces. So you can see, see it over there. In addition to several built, pro built, built works, the unit has undertaken extensive research into the way materials are sourced processed, fabricated, transported and assembled either on or off site and also interrogated the, de the demountability and life cycle of buildings. The Atlas Research Project forms a catalogue of natural building materials, elements and systems and provides an invaluable resource to future students and practitioners alike. In 2019, which was our year, the unit explored the notion of polyvalence and partially autonomous design first through a collective build project, which we're going to show you today in a rural context, and then through individual thesis projects in the urban context of Tower Hamlets in London. However, the unit continues to be concerned with how materials and industrial cultures will shape the world in the near future and are still driven by a desire to intelligently and creatively challenge the regu regulations, supply chains and processes that to a large extent prescribe how the buildings we inhabit are made function and feel. So the notion of polyvalence is not entirely new. One of the better known examples being uh, Hermann Hertzberger's Diagon House in Delft, which explores adaptive use and reconfiguration. And the unit um, defined polyvalent models as being able to adapt with minimal modification to accommodate uh, multiple uses, including living, working and um, education. So the introductory um, brief for Margin Farm called for the design of a 30 square meter polyvalent structure and asked, asked us to consider the following. At what dimensions should the building be set out? How bespoke or standardized should the construction elements be? How does the, this choice affect the project's buildability and its cost? How will the structure resist wind loads and gravity as a single unit? How would the structural principles, material specification, cross-section sizes of material and configuration of openings change if the single unit were to be incorporated into the middle or end of a terrace? How can, polyval how can the polyvalent structure be designed so that it can be moved as a single volume or partially demounted so that it can be transported to another site on the farm in two or more parts when required? And should the, should the building's language be highly articulated or take a more uh, laconic form. And finally, the project was to be designed within the parameters of the Caravan Sites Act, meaning it would not require planning permission. 
So the three relevant aspects of the Caravan Sites Act um, are the definition and construction and mobility tests. The definition of a mobile home gives a maximum size of 20 meters by 6.7 meters externally and an internal ceiling height of 3.05 meters. There is no, ex no given external roof height. The unit can be constructed on site but must have the ability to be moved in two halves, capable of being moved from one place to another. In relation to construction, the mobile home should be composed of not more than two sections separately constructed and designed to be assembled on site by means of bolts, clamps or other devices. And in relation to mobility, the structure must be capable of being moved by road from one place to another in its assembled state. So the client um, was Margin, Margin Farm, which is an industrial hemp farm in Cambridgeshire, um, which produces several hemp-based uh, products and is also undertaking um, uh, innovative collaboration with researchers to establish new hemp-based materials, um, particularly building materials. As the unit was exploring the practice of architecture as a partially autonomous discipline, the polyvalent structure was developed without any of us actually being to site. We all knew the location was a rural setting, we knew, but, but we knew almost nothing about the site itself or specific to topography. So the site is Margin Farm, which lies between Pidley and Huntington in Cambridgeshire. And the farm um, includes sort of a, a group of barn buildings to the north of the site and then three fields to the south, which are all now planted with hemp and crop. Having arrived at site, we decided to position our new building uh, within the first, uh, the first field of hemp rather than um, immediately adjacent to the existing buildings. So this is just to give you an idea of sort of the context. This is just after the first um, uh, sort of seeds have been sown in that field where our building was built. And again, these are the three existing um, barn structures that to the left, um, sort of formed our workshop, the one in the middle formed our sleeping quarters, and the one to the right, um, sorry, um, and the one to the right uh, was in the, has had a recent addition by Practice Architecture, um, Flat House, which um, some of you uh, may, may know about. Um, and that, that building is built within the footprint um, and portal frames of, an, of a pre-existing barn structure. Um, so we were actually able to visit um, Flat House uh, while it was under construction, while we were at site. Um, and this was extremely useful um, to see as it embodied many of the ideas we've been exploring in, our, in preparation for our own build. But unlike our own project, um, Flat House employs prefabricated hemp panels, which were made off site, rather than in situ hemp construction, which we used in our building. So finally, this is the location we chose for our site in, in that first field just south of the barn. Um, and you can see some planks um, on the ground, which we used to mark out, um, mark out the building. And we also raised these um, raised planks in the air to uh, sort of test uh, the relationship that this new building would have in relation to the, the adjacent hedge, but also to the um, other barn structures. So I'm now going to pass over to um, Josh, who's going to talk a bit more about the um, design process. Thank you, Tom. Um, okay. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Um, so prior to going to site, um, I'll show you a bit about the design development of the project um, and, and how we got to the, the, yeah, the final proposal that was built, essentially. Um, so uh, prior to the beginning of the build, we began the design development of the project with the unit-wide design competition at school. In small groups, we developed six proposals for spaces that would provide as much value as possible to the farm in the form of a flexible studio. This was whilst adhering to limitations of budget, the use of natural materials, and the guidelines of the Caravan Act. This following option relied on the use of plywood cassettes to form the structure of the model that could be infilled with hemocrete insulation. Another scheme considered using simple timber members that would create a crowning roof structure. This space could be used to survey the view, survey and view the surrounding hemp fields from above. 
As a direct response to the Caravan Act, this proposal will look to maximise the available space by being designed to the same dimensions of a flatbed lorry that would eventually have to move the proposal. This proposal revolved around creating a large self-supporting roof that would nestle within the landscape. And finally, developed in this section, this competition proposal questioned the height restrictions of the Caravan Act with an inverted roof and split level platforms. Noticing similarities between the projects, we formed three groups and combined forces on three separate proposals. Following this, the final proposal was chosen and we began to develop the design from an initial concept into a polyvalent studio. The chosen design referenced traditional agricultural buildings which used raised and cantilevered floors to protect crops from infestation and decay. The structure and the form was interrogated further through the development of a one to 10 timber model um, alongside considered drawing and sketching. From this, we were also able to test the heights of the cantilever floors and consider the internal spaces. The model was also used to test the structural capability of the proposal in collaboration with Structural Workshop. The structure comprises mainly of four portal frames that are interlocked by floor joists and roof purlins. The stud walls help brace the, the, the raised building from the crossmans. A further layer of spruce plywood is used on the floor and the roof to sheath the structure and enhance the lateral stability. A low cost and low impact design was achieved by stripping back unnecessary layers and using a limited palette of natural materials. Internally, the untreated Scandinavian pine structure was exposed and, build, and filled with hempcrete insulation. The floors and software were finished in spruce plywood with the floor being stained to create a harder wearing surface. Where insulation was not visible, wood fibre was used instead. And deriving from the roof, the facade was clad in hemp fibre bioresin corrugated cladding sheets, which were developed by Margent Farm, the client, in conjunction with Cambridge University. Finally, for some special joining items, uh, such as the door, foundations, windows and stair, we built with Acquire Softwood. Working with the defined material palette, we began to test window opening sizes and locations. We eventually decided that the elevations would have a simple rhythm that allows the hemp cladding to form its own language. The thin frame decoy windows are punctured into the cladding with an exposed hempcrete band below, which creates a connection between the internal and the external. As the maximum height allowance given by the Caravan Act is taken internally rather than externally, the structure was raised off the ground to create a vantage point from which to survey the farm above the line of hemp. This simultaneously provides ample sheltered external space, which may be used programmatically or simply left to allow vegetation to continue to grow beneath the building. The raised cantilever decks create a hierarchy of external spaces and a position that furniture height internally to create spaces for seating and sleeping. The studio is almost square in plan. However, the space reads in, uh, slightly differently internally due to the level changes within. Um, so in this drawing, you can see somebody sitting on the raised platform, um, which occurs on both sides. Another reason to raise the studio above the ground was to protect it from moisture. For the ground connection, we decided to use a coir again, a timber that is guaranteed to survive for 25 years below ground. This, the detail allows for the building to be disconnected from its foundation with only two bolts per fitting. Due to the structure being able to detach from the foundations, the building can be moved and is legally defined as a twin caravan unit. Conforming to the Caravan Act allowed us to circumvent the planning system and since finishing the project, inspe inspectors have visited the farm and improved the project. Prior to traveling to Margent Farm, we drew the proposal ready for construction. This allowed us to further develop the proposal and make adjustments to the structure where necessary. Uh, we also worked through key junction details between the roofs, walls and floors and specified materials for these areas. Through drawing the proposal for construction, we interrogated certain aspects far more so than you might do in professional practice. For example, we individually set out each cladding panel across the facade to allow for minimal wastage of the hemp panels. This also included drawing the batten setting out uh, for each facade for the same reason. To, uh, as well as this, the standardised manufacturing process, the portal frames are each composed with three layers of timber stitched together with coach bolts. Different lengths are used to create complex joints. A cutting list was developed for minimal wastage of the structural timbers once again. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Ollie who will talk about the collective build of the project.
Hi everyone. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about the collective build process which we underwent at Margin Farm. Um, so this is a rather wonderful photo of our build site in rural Cambridgeshire with our live audience of cows who were watching over us during our 12 days on site. Um, the 12 days took place over two stages, a week in November in 2018 and one week in March in 2019. Each time we were wrapping it on the farm, building during the daytime and sleeping in an old barn at night, which in November was an interesting experience. The location is pretty stunning. The area is pretty flat apart from the slope which the farm is located on. This gives expansive views over the surrounding farmland and huge matic skies. We were building using the power generated by the sun from the farm's solar panels, so we're really dependent upon the sun for warmth, light and energy, which are in short supply in the middle of November, as you can imagine, and you can see by this frosty morning. So we're not able to visit the site prior to construction, as we've mentioned, and on arriving on the farm for the first time, we could see, get a better understanding of the rural context of the site. It made us question the design proposal. You can see in this photo, the three existing buildings um, all share a language of traditional agri agricultural form. And it seemed like our design was at odds with this language and a more traditional form would be better for, to ingrain itself in the location. We chose to invert the roof pitch of the design, which involved hastily redesigning the roof and the connections and then formulating a new cutting list to work from. It's a testament to the strength of our structural system that we could uh, make those changes last minute. It's also a benefit of being both builder and designer where decisions can be made while you're on site. And it speaks to a wider critique of the planning system and design and build contracts. So this is our timber arriving quite late with some key materials missing. So almost immediately we're behind schedule and already on a tight deadline which really ensured that we were getting an authentic experience of working on the build site. We had ordered four and a quarter tonnes of wood, which when stacked up, starts to give a sense of how much carbon is trapped within it. You can see in this image, the wood pile is quite high, but it also stretches back another two metres. In this mass of wood, uh, there's roughly seven tonnes of CO2 captured, which is equivalent to an average UK person's yearly CO2 emissions, or a round trip to Australia, which is perhaps a bit depressing but it highlights the need for timber to be adopted by the construction industry at a larger scale. So this is our newly redrawn cutting list, um, which shows just one of the four portal frames. Uh, this list is a guide to our systemized method of construction and shows how standard sized off the shelf timber can be cut and then bolted together to create a kit of parts. And each portal frame consists of three layers of timber with a central layer dealing with applied loads and the two flanking layers creating connections with horizontal beams and giving the columns the thickness they need to deal with the um, loads of the building. You can see that some of the elements have ready-made notches, which means you can slot floor just right into the uh, building. So here's the frame laid out um, whilst we were pre-assembling it. Again, you can see the notches um, at the bottom of the image there to take the joists. The process of assembly was quite intuitive and we'd had everything labeled out but it took longer than we anticipated. First, there's getting the placement right and getting everything squared and parallel, then drilling and bolting, and it's all quite time consuming. And it goes to show that um, real world implications of something that, that might be quite quick to draw up in your computer or, or model and sketch up, actually it's quite, it can be quite tricky to assemble. So without heavy, any heavy machinery on site, we had to consider in advance what would be possible for us to carry. And between 11 students plus two tutors, it was relatively easy to carry each pre-assembled um, frame down to site. A clear benefit of pre-assembly is that you can complete the groundwork whilst, whilst the um, build has been um, pre-assembled. Our approach was for the foundations to touch the ground lightly and minimise the amount of groundwork required on the build. Building lightweight structure and legs allows us to use smaller foundation pads which require less disrupt disruption of the earth and use less cement, which limits the amount of CO2 emitted. And the foundations emitted roughly 5% of what would have been captured by the timber frame. We then have what's quite a typical barn raising, 
where the port frames were lifted into place and lowered onto foundation pads. Again, this is all done with people power. Finally, we could get a real sense of the building scale and how it sat in the landscape. Before any cladding goes on, there's this really beautiful moment where the building is just pure framework and you can really read the structure and how it's working. We designed the cantilevered decks to hang down from the roof trusses and the weight is transferred down the, through the legs and into the ground. Because the coir footings are sunk into the ground, it, it looks like they're just resting lightly on the surface of the ground. So this shows the progression of the cladding and the infill of the timber frame. Um, in the first image, we have the breather board going on, followed by uh, the membrane and the cladding battens. And you can see a bit of the um, hempcrete going in underneath. Uh, the final image shows the full, fully realized building with the hemp bioplastic cladding on the outside. So part of the project's intention was to showcase hemp as a building material on behalf of the farm. Margent Farm works as specialists to, to develop um, products using each part of the hemp plant. Hemp is fast growing and tightly packed, so it absorbs lots of CO2 per square meter of field. The CO2 is trapped in the growing product, product sorry. And hemp, it, hemp is also good at removing toxins from the ground. It was planted around Chernobyl after the nuclear meltdown to cleanse the soil. And if the roots are left in the ground after harvesting, they aerate the soil and replenish the nutrients into the earth. So this is the hemp plant, uh, um, a stalk of a hemp plant. Um, it has many uses. The hemp plant has many uses. The seeds can be eaten, um, used to make oils. The leaves and flowers have important medicinal uses. And the stalk of the plant can be, is used in construction. Um, it's comprised of a fibrous skin wrapped around a woody core or shive. Hemp fibers are the strongest known natural fibers and are used in textiles and also bioplastics. These can often be found in the interiors of sports cars as they are lightweight and strong. These fibers that were, were used externally in the bioplastic cladding and the hemp shive, the center of woody core, was used internally for the insulating hemp creek infill, returning the two parts of the plant back together. So the hemp creek mixture consists of three parts hemp shive to one parts lime binder to one parts water. The hemp shive is full of insulating air pockets and unlike other organic materials, it holds the trapped air when wet, allowing the lime to dry and bind it all together. Lime is a natural material which has a lot less environmental impact than um, comparable cement. It also has been used in the construction industry for thousands of years, and works really well with organic material, other organic building materials. Um, traditionally, it's mixed with straw rather than hemp though. So you can see here the empty framework ready to take the hempcrete infill. The framework was sheathed externally with breather board, which would hold the mixture in place, but also allow it to dry and moisture to escape. So shutting is added to the walls and the hempcrete mixture is then poured into the framework. It's tamped down, taking care not to compress it too much, as this will amount, um, reduce the amount of the insulating air pockets. The shuttering is added layer by layer and it's filled then, and then the hemp mixture is left to cure for 24 hours. And removing the framework after a day reveals a textured wall in which you can read the horizontal lines of the shuttering. Um, we chose to expose both the structure and the hempcrete, which gives these clean, sharp lines cutting through the rough texture. The lime in the hempcrete absorbs and releases water into the air and will naturally wick away any accumulated moisture, creating a healthy internal environment, preventing any mold from forming as well. Um, it's also quite a mid-weight insulation, so it has a good amount of thermal mass, which will absorb heat during the day and release it at night time. We were able to expose some of the hempcrete externally, where it's protected from driving rain beneath the cantilever decks, and this links the inside to the outside of the building. So for the roof, we just used an unjustly produced lightweight steel corrugated sheet. These were made to measure by manufacturers off-site, which saved cost and time. It was really easy to install and has a shared language with the other typical agriculture buildings on site. So the hemp bioplastic cladding sheets have been developed by Margent Farm. Um, the material is formed by pressure heating hemp fibre mat with resin made from farm waste that mainly consists of corn cob and oat hulls. You can clearly see the hemp fibres in the cladding and the textural honesty of the natural materials we use really informed the way in which we approached the design. We chose to expose the framework and the hempcrete where possible, which means you can see the layers and textures of the building. You can also understand the, how the building is constructed. It's not a black box and this holds us to account as designers. 
So the cutting sheets are a new material, so there's no set way of using them yet. We, had, we experimented with different cutting tools, electrical and manual, and found that it's actually really easy to cut. And it's hard, but its plasticity means it doesn't shatter or crack when you cut. As a material, it's really forgiving and you can remove millimetres off to get precision cuts. The sheets can be simply fixed with bat to battens with standard roofing screws after pre in the holes. So this cladding shares the language with the corrugated sheets on site. It's got this subtle verticality to it, which um, picks up the light throughout the day. And as the sun moves around the building, it always looks a bit different. On completion, the cladding is quite dark and the um, screws are quite bright, but these will dull down into the landscape and hopefully embed the building. Uh, that's the end of my section. I'm going to pass you over to Lawrence now. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, amazing. Um, so I'm going to start with the elements. Um, so the elements consist of the stair, door, and windows. Um, these were all made out of a coir. Um, for those of you who don't know what a coir is, it's a wood that's really amazing at uh, preventing water kind of seeping into the wood. Um, so it was an amazing uh, wood to use for the windows, for instance, without having to treat them and and also the door. So you could really get this kind of a natural, natural effect on the door and the stairs and windows without having to use any sort of lacquer or paint. Um, the Akoya was um, given to us actually for a sponsorship with Akoya. So the stair, the stair is um, made out of a 150 millimeter by 50 millimeter sections um, using a, con a combination of lap joints um, and grooves for the tread to take the treads um, and then glued and screwed. Um, here's some images of it in production. One of the key design ideas of the stair was to kind of keep it, to kind of take the, the kind of traditional idea of a stair and just gradually use those angles to kind of move you up the stair. The stair led you up to the door, which was we did, one of the ideas with the doors and the windows and the openings was to kind of give you as kind of to act like a family. So the openings were, were all to kind of work, work together. Um, and I'll come, I'll go into more depth when you, when we get onto the window section. But the, the main idea was to kind of have this frame, this reveal that, um, Kind of showed off the pan the cladding and really allowed it to get to give it a kind of nice full stop and kind of then allow you to have the opening and then again for the cladding to continue here's some uh, late nine late night construction um getting the getting the screws into the panel so the so the before before we kind of got it on we got the screws ready so that it could really get easily fixed So here you can see you can see the door, um, and also actually a bit of the weathering. So this photo was taken a little bit later, um, after a few, I think a few months after actually, when after we actually finished the project. So you can kind of see this beautiful transition of colour. The door is made up of lap joints, um, and 
we had a bit of an accident with the the panel, the central panel. So the, the central panel actually broke. So it was meant to be glass. Um, and that's gonna, I, I think actually it might already have been changed, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, okay, so the window, the window started off actually um, trying to kind of take on, to kind of use a very thin profile, the, the, what you can get with kind of when you use steel and trying to get this very thin edge. And from that, we kind of started to think, okay, actually, how can we do this with a coir? Can we, can we make this with the coir somehow and use its properties of being really good against, um, using its properties being really good at uh, stopping water come in um, and being able to kind of, yeah, basically we have to use this word which you'd not normally be able to do. So with, this, with the koi, we were able to get it very thin, whereas if we were to use another piece of, another type of wood, you'd probably start to get cracks. And so it allowed us to get this very thin profile. And here you can see a detail of the initial idea of this steel profile uh, that would hold the window, to, that would um, act as the frame, and then the transition to the wood frame. Um, this is the fixer, this is the fixed window. So the fixed windows use this sort of, um, this system of almost like a clamp to kind of clamp the, the glass to the main structure. Um, here you can, so this drawing shows you the kind of main components of the clamp of the frame that fix the glass. Um, we can go into a little more detail into this, uh, so you can start to see um, the way that the, the frame clamps the glass onto a secondary bit of structure that's connected to the main primary structure inside. And for you to, then you get this kind of seamless transition from inside to out. Here's the manufacturing of the profiles. The profiles were manufactured in the same uh, where the same uh, place where actual panels are pressed and produced. Again, I suppose this is a really good kind of uh, image to show you the way, to, to show you how thin this profile looks. And by, by actually, by the way we were able to use this this uh this chamfer in the section it allowed us to kind of to give you this sense of being very very thin but actually it wasn't so it kind of it gave you a little bit of this illusion that we use wow how did we use this very thin piece of wood um on the left you can see us the way that the the fixing clamps in and then we're using we're using the jigs to kind of get it in place That's the fixed window. And then the opening one. Um, the opening one is trying to take the similar, trying to take similar, we're trying to get this opening window to feel very lightweight. So we kind of make the base a little bit thicker than the top to give this sense of uh, grounding. Um, and yeah, trying to make it feel as lightweight as possible in a way. Um, and we went into, in to detail in all of the, the ways of how we can stop water from getting in and also, yeah, so trying to really develop this window as precisely as possible and, you know, going into the, getting the drips in place um, to stop water from getting in. Here's some details of the reveals. These sections were, we tried to cut the sections of the timber as much as possible from solid pieces. So trying to use as minimal amounts of connections as we could. So on the right hand side, you can start to see the, where the profile's all been kind of cut out actually on a table saw. And then there's just the one piece at the top that kind of comes on at the end and connects the glass and fixes the glass. 
in place. We mainly used a kind of combination of lap, mainly lap joints, really. Uh, lap joints and then chiseling out kind of precise angles to get it to connect. Um, actually, in there, and then, so this is the front face of the opening window. Here you can see the little bit of an angle on the front, on the kind of little bit of a chamfer to kind of allow the water to drip from the glass. Fitting. The bead going in on the, on the glass panel. And then this is it finished. Um, this is the kind of the last day on site. So we still, you still see a little bit of the, the hemp on the floor and So completion. Yeah, so the, I really love this um, photo that David took and the way it kind of really allows the building to kind of just sit in this landscape and gives you this real sense of, I suppose, vernacular architecture, this kind of architecture that almost is, it's kind of should be in this landscape. I think one of the one of the main things here is with the the corrugated cladding, the way that it the way, the way that the light hits the corrugated cladding. It's in a, in, a, in a similar way to the hedge. So the hedge has these shadows, um, these light hit bits and dark bits, and that's the same thing with the with the cladding. So there's this sort of light and shadow going on. The surrounding buildings. So again, that, you know, going back to that idea of we originally had this butterfly roof, but when we got onto the site, it it kind of transformed into this just a traditional, you know, this kind of traditional pitch, um, and it just they become a family. Again, I'm very, I think I'm very excited to see that glass in there. It just, it's, I think it's going to really open it up, open it up. Here you can really see that these, these two elements coming together and kind of coming to a connection. Um, and then again with the form, you know, kind of we've got these feet, these feet that are very, are giving it a, a very minimal contact with the ground, but also this, it's almost like this shadow, you know, this kind of shadow floating. Um, Yeah, and it's really allowing the landscape just to kind of run underneath and obviously helping with moisture. Um, and what's, you know, it's fascinating that this thing, this kind of object and this building can be taken away and then you're left with, you know, nothing. We're, we're just literally undoing a few screws. Here you get these combinations of shadows, you know, this, this kind of the shadow of the colour, almost this kind of dark face and then this deeper shadow. And then the inside, running up those stairs and then met by this opening window that, so the, the, wind, the, the opening window and the, and the uh, door are opposite one another to allow natural ventilation. And also to give, and I suppose one of the main, one of the objectives with this uh, space was not to make the windows too, too big, to allow it to kind of really have this kind of atmosphere um, that would be so kind of amazing to, so if you want to do things such as yoga in this space. And then finally, this is a picture, again, a photograph that's taken uh, a few months after we'd finished. Maybe, I'm not entirely sure, but again, again, you see, you start to see the transition in color on that facade, on the hemp cladding. And then 
And yeah, this is the team, the team at the end. Um, yeah, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing your screen. Okay. Um, I think we've already got a lot of questions coming in, um, but thank you so much for presenting. Um, I have a question, though, first, um, which is, I guess, all of these questions that are encapsulated in this really small project, um, ideas of sustainable construction um, and materiality, um, how do they how are they kind of influencing the practice, your practice now? So you're kind of all in these much larger firms now. And how is that um, influencing your day-to-day -day practice? Uh, shall I go first? Um, I think that's a, quite an interesting question. Um, so I work at May now on very large housing projects. Um, and although we can't necessarily use hemp cladding to finish the buildings, it's still good to come with a knowledge or an understanding or an appreciation of using natural materials. Um, and to try and discuss this with clients um, is, is possible to engage in these conversations. Um, but I think it will take some time um, for this kind of, to, these kind of products to be used on mass scale. But to start with such a small project as a prototype, I think that's you know, making a big step forward. And hopefully in the future, we'll be able to use these kind of materials on much larger projects. Um, so I'm not sure, I think Ollie and Tan probably have a similar scenario. Yeah, I mean, I haven't got to use it, um, sort of natural materials in a housing project yet. But uh, from my experience with hempcrete, I have brought it to certain projects and it, we are using it as practice now. So hopefully, once we've had an experience of unit once, it's something that we can then use on a large scale, hopefully in something with housing, because I feel like that's where the best opportunity to use it is. And I guess also the kind of intensive um, uh, experience that you all had in, in building and being really close to the construction, um, has that made you kind of to appreciate I, it must have made you better appreciate um, the kind of the process from drawing to um, final product in your kind of in in yeah massively, yeah. massively. some like a, a complete lesson in tolerances and what you draw on CAD is 0 0.00 millimeter perfect and then when you go to build it yourself and you're trying to cut timber on a chop saw you realize very quickly those kind of tolerances are not even close to what you would actually build. Um, I don't know, Lawrence's windows were pretty close to it. <laughs> Lawrence's windows are almost perfect. <laughs> no, but we, we really, um, we took a lot of time kind of, um, you know, me and Charlie spent a lot of time kind of setting up the cuts and, you know, it took loads and loads of tries to kind of get these angles kind of right. Um, so, yeah, we learned a lot from, from it as well. Mm. Um, okay, so we have a question from uh, Pino. I'm just going to unmute you. We'll try to. Okay, it doesn't seem to be like me. Um, he's saying, how would you fabricate insulation panels made out of hemp? What recipe would you need? Not quite sure what the question is. <laughs> um, insulation, if it's in terms of hempcrete, like we use, it was one part, um, one part lime creek, one, one, one part lime, sorry, and three parts hemp shive and one part water. Um, and then that's just mixed by hand or with a mixer. And then you just let it, uh, you shutter it into your panels and then let it cure overnight for 24 hours and then open it up. I think that answers the question maybe. Hello, sorry, here I am. Okay, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I was wondering because it looked kind of granular in a way, right? So imagine the structure be, be, being disassembled, it would fall apart. So uh, I was wondering if you could make them more solid, if you know some, how would you do that? Like, yeah, more solid, maybe more lime. I don't know if you did some research about it. Yeah, you can put more lime in. There's options to add a bit of of, um, cement to the mixture as well, which means you, you can't um, 
can't uh, recycle it as easy at the end of its life, but it does make it a stronger. But um, if we were to, the, the building can be moved because it has to be able to move to confirm, conform to the Caravan Act. But the intention is that it will never move because it's need, it, where it is, doesn't need to. So to conform to the Caravan Act, you don't actually have to be able to move. You have to be able to prove you can move your building, but you don't actually have to move it. So the intention is that it will probably never move. Yeah, and that's always the hope. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, there's a question from James Jeffries. You're unmuted. Hi guys. Um, first of all, great project. Uh, I really like it. I think it's cool. Um, the question I have is how does the price of using hemp um, in all the assemblies, so using the hempcrete and using the corrugated hemp panels compare with traditional uh, construction, say a timber frame with all of the membranes and various things that you need? Is there a percentage that you know of in terms of how it could be brought into um, kind of mainline projects? Yeah, I'm not too sure of the exact numbers and percentages, but once you start, the good thing about hempcrete is that you can take away sort of the layers of the building. It could be an external finish, it could be an internal finish. You don't yeah. have to um, have membranes. We did use a membrane, but that's because it was over two builds, so two stages, so we had to have it watertight in between the stages. So it is, it is more expensive, but once you start taking out labour costs and um, each the cost of each single layer, you actually find that it is quite com comparable. And I think yeah. also because it's um, low technology, you can you can just get a group of friends around to help you build it if if if, it, if it's your build. Obviously, in a bigger construction context, that wouldn't work. But there are okay. there's also lots of methods of. Um, doing it on large projects. So there's lots of like piping it in on big tubes. So it will just come in at once. So that there's ways of, there's ways around it. And I think, I think it should, it probably will be used more in bigger projects from hopefully in the future and continuing. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, we've got a question from Katie. You're unmuted, Katie Begby. Hiya, um, Oliver might be the best person, I think maybe to answer this. And it was just kind of like how it compared in terms of if you did do like as part of the study kind of seeing how it compared maybe to other products um like rock wool so if you'd have used it um like how deeper yeah so, how much yeah. deeper would it be so you conform to like um building standards it needs to be i think i think 300 millimeters is okay um i think 350 is 0.17 um u value so it's basically a wool thickness so you, if, if you were to have internal and external linings, you might have a slightly thicker wall, but it, yeah. it, is, it is achievable. It's definitely, definitely works as an insulation. Cool. I've got a project that I might be trying it out on. Right. <laughs> What's that? Um, potentially some uh, new build housing in the lakes. Oh, no. so, um, but yeah, we're at kind of a very early stage and there's a, a wood yard as well next door so we're trying to look for like local and natural materials mm. um so yeah <laughs> maybe lots, i'll be in touch good hemp farms in yorkshire so okay nice, isn't it <laughs> i think that's cool. good thank you i'm trying to unmute carol um <laughs> i can't seem to do it um so she's just asking about the okoya wood is the treatment of the okoya wood organic I think Alex should answer this one. He's our resident Akoya expert. He was part of the unit. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm not sure about whether it's organic, but it is definitely a natural process. Um, the acetylation of the wood effectively kind of takes away the wood's ability to kind of take on any water. Um, and the acetylation um, process effectively just pickles the wood. Um, so it uses acetic acid and it soaks the wood in acetic acid. Um, and it's soluble is just vinegar. Um, this is a, and acetic acid is also just a product of spoiled kind of foods and fruits and stuff. Um, so it is all kind of, it is all natural um, and it's not kind of like soaking in chemicals or anything. Um, yeah. Great. Um, <laughs> thanks, Alex. Um, so, yeah, I think we don't have any other questions, but please do write them in the chat if you do. Um, but how do you, I guess, to maybe to finish off, um, how do you kind of feel as 
like reflecting upon the past year and the the kind of accolades that the project has had now um i guess it's a really good way of bringing attention to um hemp as a material um but is there anything else that you'd want to kind of project with this project i guess um we all felt as students it was just an amazing experience to be building and Kind of, it was it was, it was really a life changing experience to be on the farm for two weeks, just like living um, off the solar energy and all cooking together. We it was freezing cold, but and we were around the campfire every single night and just drinking a lot of alcohol <laughs> and then getting up really early to build all day. So it, yeah, it was an incredible experience, and uh, I would wish it for any architecture student. Um, it seems like it should be almost an essential part of your education mm. yeah i think i would i would second what others saying there i mean it would be interesting to think about the implications it might have i guess an architectural education because i think for all of us that were involved it was probably the most sort of feels like we probably learned more in those sort of two weeks of being on the farm and actually you know digging foundations and you know putting in wood fiber insulation and putting a membrane on and you know there's, there's so much to be learned uh, you know from that so it would be nice it's not always possible but it'd be nice if um, i guess more students could have a similar opportunity i think that would be, be really good 